I've been coming to Bahrain pretty much every year for the last 16 years. This is a country which I have found to be the most open in the Gulf, with friendly and hospitable people. A poster child for democracy in the Middle East. For example, the opposition Wafaq party held the largest bloc in parliament. The country has a decent standard of living, with a GDP of approximately $20,000 per capita. The government provides people with free healthcare and education, and subsidized food and fuel. Take a walk around Bahrain and you'll see churches for its Christian community, and a thriving native Jewish community. In fact, the current Bahraini ambassador to America is a Jewish woman. Jews and other religious minorities have assured membership to the Shura Council, which is the upper chamber of parliament. So this country is a very different story to Tunisia and Egypt, Libya and Yemen, and Syria. And they said our mandate is only the government and we will only report human rights violations by the government. I want totally two different scenarios. If any protester in USA choose them to demonstrate in, in Wall Street, for one hour, is the government of USA will tolerant to accept to leave them for one hour? Talking about uh, dialogue now is not good. So don't compare them with Libya, don't compare them with Egypt, don't compare them with Russia. Compare them. See, Jamal, this is Bahrain, what you have done. The tiny island of Bahrain lies off the east coast of Saudi Arabia, with a population of just over a million people. Previously referred to as the Garden of Eden, Bahrain was once a popular destination for pearl divers, and buyers like Jacques Cartier travelled here to pick the world's best pearls. Bahrain gained independence from Britain in 1971 and has emerged as one of the most cosmopolitan countries in the Gulf, prompting one Western author to recently describe it as a liberal oasis in an increasingly conservative desert. Women here choose whether or not to cover, and sometimes the abaya is more about fashion than religion. Diverse communities from all parts of the world live here together. The expat community make up nearly a quarter of the country's population. Deep in the ocean of developing states, Bahrain lies curled up as if in an oyster, pretty and precious. Prior to February this year, most people would have known Bahrain only for a few headlining reasons. In 1976, it was the Concorde's first commercial destination, and decades later, it's where Michael Jackson lived during the last years of his life. More recently, it's had the honour of hosting the opening race of the Formula One calendar. I remember Tom Friedman of the New York Times came here in 2002 to cover the first parliamentary elections. Bahrain was at the forefront of those calling for democracy in the Middle East, and at the same time, it wasn't unusual to see tyre burnings and opposition protests here. Some of these rallies were driven by disaffected Shia youth, but this was a reflection of a country experimenting with democracy. Bahrain was transitioning into a constitutional monarchy with free and fair elections. So it was no surprise to me when Bahrain was the first country in the Arabian Gulf to see peaceful protests following the revolutions of Tunisia and Egypt. If any country in this region was to have protests, it'd have to be the one where people have the freedom and the right to rally. 14th of February is a special day in Bahrain. This year it marked the 10th anniversary of the establishment of a national charter which is a referendum with the approval of 98.4% of the population that took place in 2001. The opposition saw this day as an opportunity to hold rallies similar to the ones we'd seen in North Africa, but different in that what they were demanding were reforms in employment, housing and healthcare, and further democratic reforms. Opposition protests aren't unusual in Bahrain. In 2008, I dodged burning tyres when driving around near Sar village, and sometimes roads would be closed for peaceful rallies. And why not? This is, after all, a country with a 10-year history of democracy, with elected lower and appointed upper houses of parliament and elected municipalities. 
Several opposition newspapers articulate freely at the demand of political parties. And when I went to see Jamal Fakhro, a member of the country's Shura Council, he explained to me that demonstrations are a basic right of the people of Bahrain. For your information, we have been seeing demonstrations uh, in Bahrain since we started our political reforms in 2002. Most of the demonstrations used to be peaceful. There might be some clashes with, um, with the police from time to time on a very limited, limited scale. But uh, demonstrations in Bahrain is norm and is part of our life. I mean, I was told by an official that in 2000, I think, and 10 or 2009, we had as many as 500 different demonstrations in one year. The 14th of February protests were largely peaceful. The mostly Shia protesters wanted a fully independent parliament. The demands seemed reasonable, as well as somewhat probable. The protesters made a strategic choice in the location for the demonstrations, the Pearl Roundabout, located by a major highway and in very close proximity to Bahrain's main business, financial and diplomatic districts. That's why, two days after the protest began and when the thousands of protesters were refusing to move, the government stepped in to clear the roads and the roundabout. As the demonstrators resisted the security forces, two policemen and seven protesters lost their lives. The rule was not to fire any live bullets on the demonstrators, but to clear up the pair roundabout because this demonstration is not, uh, let's say, is not approved or was not licensed by the, uh, by, the, uh, by the government. Because as you know, we have a law here to say that if you want to go to a demonstration, inform the public security about it, because it's the responsibility of the public security to ensure that demonstrators are safe while demonstrating and they go to the right places and so on and so. So this, this demonstration, unfortunately, were not, were not subject to those, to, those, to those approvals. But I have seen also some films or some pictures which could really say that, that, the, that the security maybe were over harsh when they did their job. But also we have heard from the security that what they did was really to protect themselves because they discovered that with these peaceful demonstrators, they were carrying some uh, some uh, guns and some uh, uh, swords and knives and so on and so on, and they were doing what they did to protect themselves. Now, if, we, if there were some mistakes, fine. We know that there were some mistakes and people were taken to investigation committee by the Ministry of Interior. Few people have been taken there to, uh, to be investigated why they have misbehaved. To defuse the situation, the Crown Prince ordered the army to pull out and called on the protesters to engage in dialogue, reminding viewers on national television that Bahrainis shouldn't think along sectarian lines in these crucially sensitive times. He invited the protesters to return to what was now being referred to as the Pearl Square. Here you can see security armoured vehicles withdrawing and in the opposite direction a stream of traffic coming towards the Pearl Roundabout. But violence intensified as expat workers say they were dragged into the conflict and horrific amateur videos propped up across the internet showing scenes of brutality on both sides. The situation was made worse on the 17th of February when the protests spilled into the corridors and operating theatres of the state-run Salmania Hospital and what followed were allegations of shocking abuse. Conflicting reports emerged of who was in control of the premises, the army or the medical staff. Both sides accused each other of holding the hospital hostage. I didn't need to do much investigating to figure this one out. This footage clearly shows medical staff making the hospital a centre for their political activities. The 
Politicised doctors and nurses allowed cameras into the ward in order to display injuries which they say the protesters sustained at the hands of security forces. Allegations came out of patients dying on the table, while doctors and nurses became engaged in political activity. Staff erected tents in the yard and patients complained of being turned away from the door, as Shia staff treated people according to religious sects. The doctors deny this and are currently on trial protesting their innocence. Dr. Mariam al Jalahma is a medic and a human rights worker. And during the siege of Salmania, she was on the command centre committee, trying to remind her colleagues of the ethics they signed up to when they became healthcare workers. Against, of course, the administration rules and regulations, they participated in strikes and demonstrations in the hospital, which is forbidden by the law. Um, uh, nurses were uh, holding um, demonstrations within the corridors of the hospital in front of the patients. Patients were left uh, neglected and, uh, and attained in some, uh, some of the complaints that we have received. And uh, we have seen the um, abuse of the uh, ambulances where ambulances were used to transport uh, demonstrators or hide weapons. Um, there were a lot of demonstrators in front of the accident emergency. This has totally caused chaos and prevented a lot of patients from receiving uh, medical services during that time. It's, that's very sad, it makes me very angry that how could you, uh, as a profession after all this time, uh, you violate not only medical ethics but even human rights and you forget that, that actually the job you have chosen to work all your life is to help people save their lives and not only that but we have seen them um, uh, destroy the reputation of their country unnecessarily. On a mild afternoon in June, I've come to meet Abdullah al Dosari. He's a well known human rights activist, and he too says a protest that started off peaceful and representative of most Bahrainis suddenly became hijacked by a provocative minority, forcing the police to intervene. I'm not here to protect the police position or to make them in, in, looks in, in a good position that they've been uh, responding uh, to protect themselves, but the pressure, I think, on them from the public opinion, from the street of Bahrain, from everybody, from the media, from the TV, uh, put a lot of pressure on them to respond in a way that this violence and this protesting that occupying the street for a long time to be clear from the streets. People get excited. So look Within days of the protest, the Crown Prince Salman al Khalifa called on the protesters to engage in dialogue. The move was welcomed by the opposition parties and the international community. And although many differences lay ahead, dialogue with all sectors of society began. The Crown Prince's initiative came with an amnesty, which saw the release of all opposition prisoners and the dropping of charges against radical political leaders who were outside of the country. So that's why I'm with the people and also I am with all the societies. They included Hassan Mushayma. The Prince's gamble proved to be pivotal in what happened next. I'm mean, talking about uh, dialogue now is not enough. Uh, promising is not enough. We have to see something on the ground. Hassan Mishema is a man with a reputation of being radical. He was once the leader of the opposition Wifaq party, the one with 18 of 40 seats in parliament, but he defected over his rejectionist approach and now heads up the unofficial Haq party. The group refused any registration with the government, as required by Bahraini law, but was able to operate with relative freedom by the authorities. <laughs> Mushayma is no stranger to political violence and has been imprisoned many times. He served his longest sentence between 1996 and 2001. Up until his return to Bahrain in February this year, he'd been living in the UK for six months in self-imposed exile. Mushayma's return was not only controversial because of his past, but allegations soon emerged that he'd stopped over in Beirut en route to Bahrain, where some say he met with Hezbollah leaders. There's no confirmation of this, but if it's true, it could stoke further tensions here. Upon arrival to Bahrain, he immediately rejected all offers of dialogue, and the opposition found itself quickly losing control of the demonstrations.
Those people who paid, those people who been killed, those people who are ready to be killed anymore. I would say the peaceful murders, movement was hijacked by extremists who wanted more than the, what the requirements were of the people when they started the movement. And they had another agenda, a different agenda, and it was more like a coup rather than a peaceful movement. I think the simple answer is Hussein Mushema. He came to Bahrain to destroy the, the people demand. Hussein Mushema, his slogan is well known. He said, unless Kabul of death took a place in Bahrain, your rights will not be received. And this is why everybody in Bahrain was pushing himself for death, for death, so his demands and his group will be receiving more attention. Is this a way to, to raise our demand peacefully? Is this peaceful rally or demonstration? Totally is not. The problem with Mushema's party is that it didn't have the much needed support of the country's Shia clerical establishment. Mushema himself had tried to fill the role of religious guide, but without any formal training, this didn't work. And so he's said to rely on the passion of Haq party's radical message, and according to one commentator, its ability to put on the streets youths who are small in number, but ready to skirmish with the police every night if necessary. Sure enough, suddenly the protesters' demands had changed. Instead of concentrating on popular reforms that we heard about on the 14th of February, Mushema and the newly released Abdul Jalil al Sinkis, also of the Haq Party, started to radicalize the protesters. They called to change the system altogether, or in Arabic, Ishaq and Nidam. The area around the Pol roundabout was spray painted with statements like death to Al Khalifa. <laughs> First of all, I don't think that these guys, when they started the protest, their objective was to bring down government. That was totally not the objective. But this, that, was, that was developed at a later stage by a group of them who were calling to bring down the government. And that was one of the biggest mistakes they have done. Hassan Mushema came and demanded the end of the Bahraini ruling family. King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa, his son, the Crown Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa, and the Prime Minister, the King's uncle, Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa. The increasingly militant tendency of the protesters brought a response from the more moderate groups and the Sunni population. Sheikh Abdul Latif Al Mahmoud is a popular man. At the end of February, he rallied his supporters to counter the call for Iskat al Nidam. I met with him at the country's Islamic Education Association, where he told me that many people in the country felt left out when the radical elements arrived and overshadowed the protests. وأنه ليس يوجد في الدولة إلا طرفان يعرون في اسمهم الشعب والنظام الحاكم هو الطرف الثاني عندما بدأت المشاكل وتطورت قليلا أعلن ولي العهد أنه يفتح باب الحوار للوصول إلى حل المشكلة المجموعة الكبيرة هذه الأربعمائة ألف أو يزيد هؤلاء المجموعة وجدوا أنفسهم سوف يكونون بعيدين عن الحوار وبالتالي كان لابد أن يثبتوا وجودهم لأن أصبحت القضية ليست قضية خاصة بهذه المجموعة وإنما هي تعلق بقضايا الدستور بقضية مستقبل البحرين ولذلك جاءت المجموعات الكبيرة هذه كلها لكي تقول نحن طرف له ثقله في البحرين ولا بد أن نشارك في الحوار 
ولا بد أن يكون لنا رأي في تغيير النظام أو في الإصلاحات التي يمكن أن تدخل على النظام لأننا معنيون بذلك فكان هذا هو ال... الذي جاء من الجماهير وعبرنا عن آراء الجمهور في هذه الأحداث ووضعنا أيضا خطتنا أننا أيضا ندعو إلى الإصلاح سواء في الجانب الدستوري أو الجانب السياسي أو الجانب التنظيمي للدولة أو الجانب المعيشي ولذلك نحن قدمنا ورقة تفصيلية لكل القضايا التي يمكن أن نضعها على طاولة الحوار On the 3rd of March, Sheikh Abdul Latif Al Mahmoud rallied his supporters again. This time, he says over 300,000 people turned up. It was in an effort to show solidarity with the Al Khalifa family and in support of gradual reforms. This was the Sunni response to Mishayma's radical protests. <laughs> Sheikh Abdel Latif Al Mahmoud's assembly brought people into the streets around Al Fatah Mosque. Al Mahmoud and his supporters welcomed the release of prisoners and agreed with most of the Shia opposition's demands that were echoing around Pearl Roundabout. However, the very clear difference was his insistence on the continuing rule of the Al Khalifa family. A month into the protests, Mushayma made a move that escalated the situation. He led his supporters on a march to the Rifa Palace, the royal court. Locals say it was an attempt for major sectarian confrontation in this largely Sunni area. Police managed to place barbed wire across the road to prevent the Shia protesters from confronting Sunni vigilantes who'd come out to show solidarity with the royal family. Here in Bahrain, we have a total agreement between the people of Bahrain and the royal family that the people of Bahrain agree that the royal family will continue to rule the country. We don't have any sort of disagreement on that issue. And this wasn't exclusive to the Sunni groups. I asked various Shia opposition parties about the ruling family to discover that it was their support for the Al Khalifa family which ultimately differentiated them from the likes of Hassan Mushayma and other radical Shia groups. So you have had dialogue you're saying yes. with the crown prince yes and this is a positive step yes of course this is positive step actually يعني, he's, uh... at the office of the nationalist democracy society the leader of al qaumi party sits in front of a poster of saddam hussein his group is part of the democratic alliance which includes the well-known wa'ad party i asked him about his party's demands and whether he agrees that king hamad should go the roundabout was like almost like a buzzer yeah, and everybody going there and he uh, announced what he won't demand. For the seven societies, political societies, they're asking for reform. But as you know, so there is other parties there, uh, unofficial party, they're asking to remove the regime in Bahrain. And that people, who's the one, they start to block the road. Is this something you agree with, the removal no, of, of course, the... of course, we didn't agree. In part two, we hear from an Indian expat who was beaten up at the roundabout. And we ask what lies ahead for Bahrain's political future. How can you uh, convince your people that your presence in such parliament is uh, something going to be of value?